Okay, so now we're gonna, uh, given this uh, sort of DAG uh, setups, we can discuss how um, the graph can be useful um, for detecting some of these relationships between the variables. And the first thing I'm gonna cover is something called deseparation. Deseparation is a way to figure out whether um, variables on a DAG is conditionally independent. Okay, so we can ask the question of does the conditional independence relation, so A is conditional independent of B given C, hold if A, B, C are some sets of vertices of the DAG. Okay, so take the previous DAG and then you can sort of uh, ask the question of does these two variables independent of these other two variables conditioning on this third set of variables. So how do we do that? Well, first step is to identify all paths, um, both causal and non-causal, from any vertex in A to any vertex in B. So if you're trying to check the conditional relationship between A and B given C, then you identify all paths uh, from A, any vertex, vertex in A to any vertex in B. Okay, so write down all the paths. And then you're going to check if each of these paths is blocked. Okay, so what, does, what do we mean by blocked? Path is blocked if at least one of the following conditions hold. First, a path includes a non-collider vertex that is in C. Okay, so the path should include a conditioning variable that is not, that is not a collider. Okay, so you cannot include the collider, but it should include a non-collider vertex. That's in C. Secondly, it includes a collider that's not in C. So the path should include a collider that's not in the conditioning set. And no descendant of any collider is in C. Okay, so um, any collider, if, uh, yeah. If there is a descendant, if there are variables that are causally affected by a collider, they shouldn't be in C. They shouldn't be in the conditioning set. So if um, this one of the one of the two conditions, so either one is fine, uh, holds, then if, uh, the, we call path is blocked, and we'll give an example uh, so you can see. Finally, if all paths are blocked, we call A is D separate from B by C. Okay. And if A and B are D separated by C, then A is conditionally independent of B given C. Right. So what this says in the, in the high level is that if you look at uh, the graph, by applying this rule, you can read off um, the conditional independence relations. Automatically, there's a rule that it should do that. Okay, and if A and B are deconnected by C or not deseparated by C, then uh, A and B are may not be conditionally independent given C. There exists at least one distribution that's compatible with the DAG that makes A and B conditionally dependent on each other given C. Okay, so you cannot um, say they are conditionally independent for any distribution that's comparable with the DAG. Okay. Uh, so this separation is very useful because once you write down the graph, then you can figure out whether um, variables are independent or dependent. All right, so here's an example um, to get you familiarized with this separation. So let's ask the question, of um, are W and Y marginally independent of each other? That is, are they independent of each other without conditioning on any variable? It may not be obvious if you just look at this and then you know somebody asks, are they independent? Um, but we can look at that. Uh, so first thing is to basically enumerate all the paths between W and Y, both causal and non-causal, and then see if they are blocked. Okay. In this case, there is no conditioning variable, so we can we, we just have to see without conditioning on the variable um, is anything blocked. Okay. 
So it turns out there's two um, paths that, uh, that are blocked. Um, the reason why these two paths is blocked is because for the first one, the Z is a collider. So if the collider is on the path, then the path is blocked without conditioning. In fact, if you condition it, you're going to unblock that path. Okay? Similarly, on the right, the second one, you see that Z and T are both colliders. And so they are um, blocked in this path. Okay. Now there is also unblocked path, W to Z to X to Y. Uh, that's a causal path that's completely unblocked. Okay. So W is actually causally affecting Y. And then there's another path, W to Z to X to T to Y. That's also a causal path that's being unblocked. Now, next question is, which variable should we condition upon in order to make W and Y condition independent? So what variable should we condition on to make this W and Y, which are dependent right now because there's unblocked path, uh, possibly dependent because there are unblocked paths, uh, how can we make them in condition independent? Okay. So what we want to do is to block the unblocked path, there are two of them, without unblocking the blocked path which there are two of them, okay? So we want to block the second um, two path while uh, not unblocking the first two path. If you condition on X, that would do this because if you condition on X, then unblocked path, which both has the X in it, which is, they are not colliders. So by conditioning on X, we can block those unblocked path and um, the conditioning on the x, the first um, uh, blocked path uh, doesn't contain x, right? w, z, u, t, y, that doesn't contain x. So conditioning on x doesn't do anything for that. So it will stay blocked. And then for the second path, um, there is an x, but the x is not crider. So blocking on x wouldn't affect um, this path. It will still stay blocked. Okay, so that way we were able to uh, block all the, all the uh, paths which make um, W and Y condition independent given X. However, conditioning on T and Z or one of the two would unblock some of the blocked path because they are prior. So for example, if I condition on T, uh, say condition on Z, then I, I'll be able to block those two unblocked paths. So in the below, I can block both of them by conditioning on Z. But if I do that, I'm going to unblock the uh, blocked path because in both cases, Z are the colliders. So in general speaking, blocking the colliders, like conditioning on the colliders, um, induces, like, you know, unblock uh, the blocked path. So one, one has to be careful about conditioning on, on colliders. Let's next consider how to use DAG to estimate or identify the causal effect. So here we're going to uh, use this, introduce this uh, backdoor criterion. So this criterion can be used to answer the question, can we non-parametrically identify the causal effect of a variable t on uh, the outcome y? given a set of variables x, like conditioning on or controlling for a set of variable x, can we identify uh, causal effect of the treatment on the outcome, given the graph you have? So what is the backdoor, uh, backdoor criteria for uh, this set of variables that allows you to estimate the uh, treatment effect on the outcome? Um, so the first, uh, first condition, is that no vertex in X, no uh, variable in this conditioning set X is a descendant of T. That is, it shouldn't be affected, causally affected by the treatment. In other words, you should not control for the consequence of the treatment in order to avoid the post-treatment bias. So this is relatively intuitive. So you shouldn't control for a variable that's causally affected by the treatment. The second criteria, a second condition of the criteria is that this x, the set of variables x, blocks all paths 
uh, between T and Y with an incoming arrow into T. That's why it's called backdoor pass because the pass is coming into the treatment variable T. Okay. So we should uh, make sure that the X, the condition is that X uh, blocks all the path between T and Y with an incoming arrow into T. Idea is that we need to block all non-causal path in order to um, estimate the causal effect of the treatment on the outcome. Okay, so the backdoor path are non-causal path by definition because it's coming from Y and into T. So it's going the uh, reach the partially the uh, uh, opposite direction um, compared to the causal direction. What's nice about this is we can basically check this uh, condition. So we can check to make sure that X doesn't contain the post-treatment variable. And we make, can make sure that the X blocks all paths between T and Y with an incoming arrow into T. And once we uh, check that, we know that we can just condition X and estimate the treatment effect. And the estimation, there's a, also a formula. So we can just condition um, we can model the condition distribution y given t and x and then average over um, distribution of x. So this is sort of the standard regression uh, causal estimation that we use. We're going to model y given t and x and then average over the distribution of x. If you recall how we use the regression models to estimate, say, average treatment impact. So uh, what's nice about backdoor criterion is, is to uh, uh, give you a way to confirm that X is sufficient uh, for identifying the causal effect of treatment on the outcome. Uh, there's a, also the related confounder selection criteria, which says if there exists a set of observed covariates that meet the backdoor criteria, Right, because there's more than one set of observed covariates that could meet this criteria. So suppose there exists a set of observed covariates that meet the backdoor criteria, then it is sufficient to just condition on all observed treatment covariates that are either cause treatment, outcome, or both. So this is the justification for um, intuitive practice that's used in the applied research where we often control for variables that are pre-treatment and that are, you know, causing the treatment or outcome or both. The confounder, um, uh, you know, how to sort of adjust for the confounding variable. We also often look at the variables that is the cause of the treatment and cause of the outcome or both, right? And so it justifies as long as there is a set of covariates uh, that meet the backdoor criteria this strategy is sufficient for identifying treatment impact on the outcome. Okay, so let's uh, look at the one example of backdoor criteria. So suppose we have uh, this kind of graph and we are interested in identifying the causal effect of T on Y. Okay, so now let's check uh, what's the set of the variables that we need to condition on in order to uh, identify the causal effect on T on Y. Uh, to do this, we need to look at, um, make sure that, that we don't first control for uh, post-treatment variables. So in this case, uh, T is affecting X as well as Y. So we don't, we definitely don't want to control for X because that would be, that would introduce a post-treatment bias. And so X won't be included in the conditioning set. And now we need to check to make, um, see how to block the old backdoor path, okay? So uh, if you look at this graph, there are uh, three backdoor paths. T, um, you need to look at the incoming arrow into T. So there's T, Z, Y path, and also T, Z, U, X, and Y path. And then there's also T, U, X, and Y path, okay? So if you just look at this, um, the third path, T, U, X, and Y is already blocked because X is a collider. So that's, it's on a path. So that's already blocked without doing anything. And the second path is also blocked uh, because that also includes X and X is a collider. 
Uh, the first backdoor path is open. So we need to close this. Uh, we need to block this. In order to block that, we only need to condition on Z. Okay? And conditioning on Z will not uh, unblock the second backdoor path because um, Z is not a writer on that path either. Okay, so we can block one the first backdoor path by conditioning on Z, which will not unblock uh, second and third uh, backdoor path. And we have a formula to uh, estimate the. Uh, distribution of potential outcome by simply conditioning on Z. So Z is the only uh, confounder that we need to condition. So this um, show illustrates how we can use simple graph criteria to figure out what variable we should be conditioning on. Now, all this like this separation uh, criteria and the backdoor criterion, um, you can see that this allows us to, once you write down the graph, uh, we can check each path, and this can be done by computer, right? So instead of, like we did, uh, humans uh, checking one by one, actually the computer can actually um, check this automatically for you. So that we don't, you know, unlike humans, computers, if you give explicit um, rules, they can uh, do it automatically and very quickly and accurately. And in fact, there is a software that um, allows you to do that. Uh, it's called Daggety. Uh, it has a R package as well. And here's a picture of that software. And all you have to do is to draw a DAG. Um, so here is, there's a DAG that's written. And once you draw a DAG, then you see the testable implications, the condition, all conditional independence relationship on the right. Um, so A and B are independent, A and D are independent, given E, B and E are independent, so on. And um, you can also, um, it also tells you how to estimate uh, treatment effects. So in this case, it says no adjustment is necessary to estimate the total effect of E on D. Okay. So as you can see, um, you still have to come up with the DAG which uh, encodes all the scientific assumptions um, of various variables. But once you write down that DAG, um, this uh, software will tell you whether, you know, what conditional independence relationships are encoded here implied by this graph and how you might estimate um, treatment effect um, and use under this assumption.